Hear, O Lord, your servants gather. Indeed. Amen. That was beautiful. Beautiful way to start worship. Good morning. Welcome to worship, those of you here in person and those of you who are joining us later online as well. Today is World Communion Sunday. Um, I will just confess, our sermon series does not fit in with that. And I just didn't try to force it. <laughs> However, with some of the visuals that we have, with some of the music, um, the different breads that we'll have for communion, we are reminded today that we gather with Christians all over the world at Christ's table as we meet Christ in the breaking and the sharing of the bread and the cup. Today we also receive the Peace and Global Witness Offering, which is one of our denomination's special offerings. It's received on this Sunday or this time of year each year. The offering supports peacemaking ministries. 25% of it stays locally, 25% of it is um, used regionally, and then 50% of it is used for peacemaking ministries globally. Um, those include things such as um, disruptions that are caused by climate change, by systemic racism, and by human trafficking. These offerings are part of what it means to be a connectional church. All um, the PCUSA churches participate in this offering, and when we all give a little bit, it adds up to a lot. We can always do more together than we can on our own. Um, so you will find an envelope in your bulletin this morning. You can also give online using the QR code or by just going online on your computer or via text, and instructions for all of that are on the back of your insert and on the back of the, the envelope as well. 
Um, lastly, um, Brian and I would invite you to stay for After Church Fellowship um, this morning. We continue to be grateful for all of the love and support that you all poured out on us as we um, got ready for our wedding in June and wanted to say a thank you when we came back from that time away. It was things had kind of died down and so um, Melanie from Fellowship suggested maybe wait till fall. So it's fall. Um, so we just um, invite you to share in that. Brian had wanted to use leftover wedding food. I told him no. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me to quit overthinking it as we got closer. But at, anyway, um, I will tell you, Brian is a trooper and, and a keeper, um, but he worked really hard. I'm kind of just here today, but um, he did work, do a lot of work in preparation for this. So um, thank you for that. And we just invite you all to enjoy that time together. As we um, prepare to worship God, let us spend a few moments in silent preparation, reflecting on our own hearts and minds, what we bring with us and what we need to let go of for this hour so that we can focus on our holy God. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. Around the world, people gather to break bread and pour wine. We gather with them in heart and mind. Around the world, the banquet of God is prepared for the table. We who share in the banquet come eagerly to receive and share. Around the world, the broken body is made whole. We, who are many, are made one. People of God, let us come, for all is ready. We come now to worship the Lord.
With the confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Gracious God, in your generosity, you have given us a world of abundance and diversity. Yet we live guided by greed and selfishness. In Christ, you made us one family and intend for us to be united. Yet we have built walls to separate us from those who are different from us. By your spirit, you give us wisdom and creativity, and we have used those to trick each other and to develop weapons of destruction and death. In all this, we have not lived according to your purposes, for us or for your creation. Forgive us, Lord, for failing to recognize and live in your goodness. Amen. God promises us, in the midst of our brokenness, there are signs of wholeness and hope. The stories we share with one another in faith tell of God's work in us. Let us hear and believe the good news of the gospel once more. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. children this morning, if you all would go ahead and come forward as well. You brought a friend today? I see you brought a friend. Everybody has friends. I'm going to have to remember to bring my friends. Everybody should bring friends to church. Don't you think that would be great? You have what? You have snacks. Do y'all want to sit? Well, I mean, if you don't want to. Okay. Are you good? All right. I brought friends too. Look, I brought friends. Yes, so, and, well, this is the globe. No, the globe is not my friend, but these are my friends that are helping today with world, with um, time with children. What's under there? I'll show you that in a little bit. So today is Communion Sunday, and that's the day that we gather at this table. You want to have a look? And we break bread. Oh, we got to take that out of the plastic, don't we? <laughs> We break bread. Good thing I looked at that. And um, we share the cup, right? And it reminds us, we come again and again to this table. Can I hold your friend? I'm going to have him help me. It's all my time with you. Jacob, can I have your friend? So we come again and again to this table. I know it's your friend. May I borrow him? Thank you. We come again and again to this table because it reminds us how much God loves us. And we tell the story of God's grace. Now, today is a very special Sunday, though, 
because Christians all over the world, that's why we have all these globes and all these different fabrics, Christians all over the world are coming to the table today. Did you think of me? Yesterday night, did the tooth fairy come? No? He swallowed it. Oh, yeah, the tooth fairy sometimes needs a little bit of advance notice. That's true. Well, very exciting. I'll have to let them. Okay, I believe you. And we're going to hang on to this friend as well. All right. Are you going to hang on to that friend? All right, so listen. I'm going to spin the globe. Ella, can you point? I'm going to spin the globe, and I want you to point to somewhere on the globe. Anywhere, okay? Anywhere. Try a country, not the water. What you got? Well, that's a compass. That's a compass. Let's try again. All right. Did you find one? All right. How about you? Fallon, can you do it? Did you get a country? You got the water, too? This was work easier in my head. We're going to go with this country. And it is, I think it's Angola. So guess what? Christians in Angola, way over here in Africa, are celebrating communion today. They're having communion too. And I brought these friends with me this morning so that they could show you some things because they've been to other countries. So they're going to show you some things that they brought from other countries. And we're going to talk about that people in those countries are celebrating communion too. And I tell you what, next time let's leave all this good stuff in the pews. How about? All right, so let's see. I'm going to start over here with Sue and let's see what she brought. Y'all ready? <laughs> Oh, wow. So, Fallon, can you read that for us? <laughs> How about that? That's in a different language, isn't it? And it's from what country? From Japan. Christians in Japan. You know how to read that, Jacob? Do you? Because I know how to read the pictures, but I don't know how to read the title. Guess what? Christians in Japan are celebrating communion today. David, what'd you bring? You brought a what? A, what? a Weedle. Cool. And what country is that from? Christians in Puerto Rico are, guess what? Celebrating communion today. What did you bring, Susan? <laughs> How about that? They were just there. And today, people in Ireland are doing what? Celebrating what? Communion. And Jane? Ooh, pretty. They have a service every day, several services every day. And they're six hours ahead of us, so they've already had communion. <laughs> they've had communion this morning on World Communion Sunday. And they have communion every day in the morning. Every day in the morning. So people in England are celebrating communion too. Everywhere around the world, every country that you can think of, if there are Christians there, guess what they're doing? Celebrating communion. They're having the bread and the cup. Let's pray together. You all are very distracted today. <laughs> Let's have a prayer together. How about I say a little bit and you repeat, okay? Dear God, we thank you for your church all over the world and for calling us to be one body in Christ. We thank you for the bread 
and for the cup that remind us of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Let's see whose friends do I have. Kitty, kitty, thank you for letting me hold. Thank you, my friends, for helping me this morning. Um, Spider-Man, don't forget your hat. All right, you got it? Good morning. Good morning. Eager for the living word, let us go to God in prayer. Holy Spirit, grant us openness and give us understanding of what we each need to receive through the reading and the hearing of your word. Bind us together with the cord of your loving spirit. The Bible verses today come from Acts 9, verses 36 through 43. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and charity. At the time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without a delay. So Peter got up, and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the windows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing, clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of the excuse me, Peter put all the, them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Thank you. 
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. Hear now God's word to us this day. Now, as they went on their way, he, that is Jesus, entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today is week four of our five-week sermon series on the core values of McGregor that came out of the mission study. So I thought, pop quiz. Let's see how many of them you can name. Not if you're on the mission study team, you get a pass. I assume you already know them. But how, what, are, what, have, what have we talked about so far? Love. Justice. Justice. Spirituality. Spiritual nourishment. Caring. Caring relationships. That one's a gimme. It's in the bulletin, y'all. <laughs> community. Yes. Engage in the community. Good. We're getting there. We're getting there. Pretty good. And I hope that as we continue to talk about these, they'll become the language that you use to talk about McGregor. When somebody asks, what is your church about? You've got these five go-to words, the ones that you can remember anyway, uh, to talk about and describe this church. So today we take a look at caring relationships, something that I think is definitely valued already here at McGregor because I see it and, and hear about it really in so many ways. When you talk about who you've called or who you've checked up on, or I know that you send cards or provide meals and in countless ways, you care for each other. During the mission study process, when we had you all meet in groups for several weeks at a time, I recall hearing from many of you how much you enjoyed that, just getting to know each other people that maybe you knew their name, but now you got to hear something of their story and that was meaningful for you. And it's also been interesting to hear in my time here, as I have from many of you, things like, you know, I don't even know what so-and-so does or did for a living. That's kind of a basic information piece. It's generally the first question we ask somebody we meet. What do you do? 
So I kind of think that opportunities for relationship building, they a little, a lot <laughs> waned during the pandemic, didn't they? And so now we have to be intentional about providing them again in new, meaningful ways for everyone. Because caring relationships are valued here at McGregor, it will be important for you all to continue to cultivate them with each other, with newer members and friends, with the community, with those perhaps you don't know all that well even here, even if they've been here a while. So while I know that you know a thing or two about caring relationships, it's always helpful to take a look and learn what scripture has to tell us about them. I have long loved this story from Acts about Dorcas or Tabitha. Often it is read during the Easter season and the focus is on resurrection. Peter telling her to get up, to rise, and so she does. But what I want us to focus on this morning are the people and the relationships. In this story, Tabitha was obviously an important figure in her community, and yet we don't know a whole lot about her. What we do know is this is the only place she is mentioned in Scripture. She's the only woman to explicitly be named as a disciple, and she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. Specifically, she made clothes for the widows in her community. And it's important for us to recognize how valuable a gift this would have been and to consider how the people in Joppa, particularly the widows, were affected by her death. The widow's status in that day was precarious. They were often in want of even life's necessities. They had no inheritance rights. If they didn't have a son, they had no one to take them in. They were often exposed to harsh treatment by others in their community. But scripture tells us again and again that God extends concern to the widow. The people Israel were obligated to care for the widow, as well as the stranger and the orphan, those who are outcast. Jesus extended mercy and sensitivity to widows in his ministry, and here we have Tabitha who in fact may have been a widow herself, but out of her own means made clothes for women who otherwise might have had only rags to wear. In caring for these women, Tabitha offered them more than clothing. She offered them hope, ensuring that they could walk among their community properly dressed. This no doubt would have given them some sense of self-confidence, None of us likes to stand out as different, as less than, as an outcast. Tabitha made sure that the widows in Joppa didn't. And they may have wondered among themselves, what would we ever do without her? What will we ever do when she is gone? And when that day came, ah, how they mourned her death. Luke tells us in detail how they washed and cared for her body, how they laid her in an upper room, the custom of the day, how they grieved openly, weeping at her death. It is such a tender and vulnerable scene. You see, when Tabitha died, so did some of the hope and the life and the care for the widows in her community. Because caring relationships, like the ones Tabitha showed to these women, are life-giving. That's why they're so important. It's not just about knowing someone, though that's certainly part of it, but it's about the hope and the life, the encouragement that these relationships provide. So when these women heard that Peter was nearby, they sent for him. And Peter arrived to find the widow's still weeping. It says that they showed him the tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made when she was with them. How familiar a scene. When someone that we love or care about dies, don't we also gather and talk about that person, share our memories, 
Maybe we connect ourselves to them through the objects that they leave behind, things that they have given us or things that they have made or that simply belong to them. They're part of their story and they serve as symbols of our relationship with them. The widows of Joppa had the very clothes on their backs to show what Tabitha had meant to them, how she had cared for them, She had provided a basic necessity, offering hope in the midst of their darkness. Such a caring relationship when far beyond knowing what they did for a living or how they spent their time in any way, it was a real knowing, a seeing. Tabitha saw the widows in her community, really saw them, saw their needs, saw them in their vulnerability, and cared for them. And we find in our passage from Luke's gospel as well that Jesus really saw Mary and Martha too. Martha has been busy, 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 busy preparing her home for Jesus' arrival so he'd have a clean space to rest, clean water to wash his road-weary feet, fresh sunshine-filled sheets on the beds, a nice meal, wine for his travel-weary body and soul. We know how it is. We've welcomed guests into our home too, and we know the work that is involved. The cleaning of the house, dusting, sweeping, vacuuming, washing, planning a menu, going to the grocery store, cooking, making dessert, on and on. It is exhausting. And sometimes... We find ourselves so busy that our guests are left unattended or left to visit with others while we remain busy trying to make sure things are comfortable for their stay. Guests whom we've been so excited about having and spending time with, and we end up missing out on the visit. But with good reason, we say, right? We care about our guests. We want their visit to be special, and that just takes our time. It seems like that's exactly what Martha is trying to do with Jesus. Sure, she'd have been like, like to have been out there sitting around at his feet, listening to his stories, his teachings, his adventures. But when you welcome someone into your home, You have responsibilities to tend to in order to make sure their stay is as comfortable as possible. And I imagine that as time went on, she began to mutter under her breath about her sister Mary, who in Martha's opinion should have gotten up off that floor and helped her. And then they'd both have had time to spend with Jesus. I mean, what was Mary thinking sitting in there, enjoying the company of the guests, while Martha was stuck doing all the work? Well, Martha finally has enough, and she approaches Jesus and says, Listen, don't you care that Mary has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. Jesus, of course, does care. He cares about Martha, and he cares about Mary but he doesn't do as Martha demands. Instead, he calls her by name, Martha. Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part. How might we interpret that, I wonder? Martha, relax, sit down, enjoy the time that you have with me. Martha, chill out. Leave Mary out of this. I don't need all this fuss and bother that you're going to. Just who are you trying to impress anyway? Or maybe it's a sense of, Martha, how about you do your thing and you let Mary do hers? What Jesus sees in Martha is that she's worried and distracted by many things. Her focus is all over the place and not in the one place it should be. She is so worried about being a proper hostess that she cannot give gracious attention to her guest, even when it's Jesus. Not only that, but she complains about her sister in front of everyone 
perhaps embarrassing her, insinuating that Jesus doesn't care about her, and imploring him to intervene and tell Mary to help her. She has boiled over, and all this hangs out in front of Jesus and everyone else. Her worry and distraction and aggravation at her sister has driven a wedge between them and even between herself and Jesus. And Jesus cares enough to speak a hard truth to her and call her out. And that's an important piece of caring relationships too, albeit a bit harder. Speaking hard truths to someone feels close enough to confrontation and conflict that we prefer to just avoid it, sweep it under the rug, let it go, and move on. But what if Jesus had done that with Martha? Instead, he loved her enough. He cared for her enough to want more more for her than her frustrated, distracted, overly busy flurry of activity. He cared about her enough to say, this is not okay, Martha. This is not helpful. This is not what is needed or even wanted. Now, we don't need to spend our time complaining about other people or the way someone does something differently than you or I do it. But when we care about someone, as Jesus cared for Martha, we care enough to be upfront with them. When, for example, their behavior or something they've said hurts us or another person, or when we don't think they're pulling their load, or maybe they're pulling too much of the load. Rather than maybe talking about them behind their backs to somebody else or just ignoring it and letting it go on or waiting till we become, come to a boiling point like Martha did and explode all over the place, in a caring relationship, we learn how to say hard things in kind and loving ways. If we don't, then what we're really saying is that we really don't care all that much. We don't care enough to be honest. And maybe it's because it makes us uncomfortable and we're not sure how the other person will react. Or maybe we're afraid that what we say will hurt the other person and we don't want to do that. But isn't it in the long run more hurtful if we don't say how we're feeling, what we're thinking, what even perhaps needs to be said for the greater good, for the health, health of our relationship with that person or even that of the community. You know, we don't know how Martha responded to Jesus' honesty with her. And maybe that's because we're supposed to think about it for ourselves. How would we have responded? How do we respond when someone we care about speaks a hard truth to us? Do we react out of our hurt and pain? Or do we take time to prayerfully consider what's being said and what we might need to hear? This is hard stuff, I know. And honestly, I am not that great with it myself. But it's also why caring relationships is such an important core value, because it's often in those hard conversations that relationships deepen and flourish, that we ourselves grow and become more of the person God intends us to be. And that, I think, is a key piece of what the community we call church is about encouraging one another to be more than we were yesterday, to live out a fuller expression of ourselves as individuals and together as a community. We can only do that when we have established caring relationships. And those take time, and they take intention, and they take a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of love. That's why we come to this table again and again and again to receive the grace that we all so desperately need and to offer that same grace to each other. You know, Scripture calls us 
to examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. It tells us we are to reconcile with one another before we bring our offerings of ourselves to God. So before we continue in our worship this morning, I invite us all to take some time to do just that. We're going to sit in a few moments of silence, which I know for some of you is uncomfortable, but don't spend that time listening to the clock tick. (laughs) Instead, let's spend that time examining ourselves, considering our relationships, what things maybe we have been avoiding that we might need to say to another because we care about them. Maybe it's something about their health or a habit that we're concerned about. Maybe we need to seek or offer forgiveness with someone. Maybe we need to share something that's been bothering us and that has affected our relationship with that person. Whatever it is, and we've all got something, let us commit to practicing this core value this week, taking that step and speaking that word to someone because we care and we truly value that relationship. And let us trust that God's grace, broken and shared and poured out at this table, will be sufficient for those conversations and those relationships. So invite us all now to a time of silence in prayer and reflection. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, we continue to give because we have been blessed to receive. Our gifts, whether large or small, serve this church and help our neighbors down the street and around the globe. When we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. So through our giving, we ourselves are blessed, and I would remind you again of the Peace and Global Witness offering, as well as our weekly offering that supports this church's mission and ministry. Thank <laughs> you. 
motions to that one too. I don't know them, but if anybody does, I want to learn them. <laughs> As we prepare to receive communion this morning, um, you're invited to come forward. The elder will place bread in your hand. Um, if you require gluten-free bread, please just let them know we do have that available. Um, and then step to the next station and um, take your cup from the tray. We invite you to return to your seat and hold your elements until all have received and we will all partake together. And we'll start with the outside wings and then move into the center sections. And there's only a few of you on the outside, so that's not quite as critical. But those of you in the center sections, if you'll come, when we come down the center and around back that way. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That way you're not stepping all over each other. And just start from the front um, and towards the back. We gather today around this table in places near and far eating tortillas and pita and non bread and crackers and leavened bread, wheat bread, dark bread, even wonder bread, good old sandwich loaf bread, every bite, the body of Christ. And we partake of the cup, whether it's served in a pottery chalice or a silver goblet from a golden spoon or a tiny cup, however we receive it, the blood of Christ. This table reaches far, back to those who have followed long before we have and forward to those who will follow long after we are gone, and it reaches wide, across this sanctuary and around the globe. So let us come to this table with joy and thanksgiving this day. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks. To the Lord our God. Let us pray together. The Lord our God, creator of all that lives, all that has breath, it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give you our thanks. In the beginning, you hovered over the watery abyss and spoke life into the world. At the sound of your voice, there was light. There was earth and sea and sky. There were trees and plants and fish and birds, animals great and small. And you formed us, O oh God, every one of us in your image shaping us from the dust of the earth and breathing the breath of life into our being. And you pronounced your creation good, even very good. But we did not and do not appreciate your goodness, the beauty of your creation. We spoke words of blame, words of hatred, bringing brokenness to your world seeking to drown out your voice of creation to make our voice equal to yours. Again and again, O oh God, in steadfast love, you called us back to your way, sending your prophets to speak truth to power and to proclaim once more your ways of love, peace, and justice. In the fullness of time, you entered our chaos again embodied in Jesus of Nazareth. You again spoke to us and filled us with life. You again touched our bodies and we were made whole. And though this broken world broke your body, you broke free from the tomb in the glory of resurrection. So with those who gather around tables of peace and hope in every corner of our world, and with those who are with you in glory, we offer our deepest praise and thanksgiving. Holy are you, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, whom your Spirit anointed to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim your salvation. 
Jesus spoke your words of peace and walked in the way of peace. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and shared meals with sinners. By his life, death, and resurrection, O oh God, and through the gift of your own spirit, you gave birth to your church, delivering us from slavery to sin and death, and making with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. And so this morning, we join with the church in every place in proclaiming the abundant life you offer to all as we gather at this table and pray together with the confidence of your children, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal and arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And indeed, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. Friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Let us come, for all is ready. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Friends, this is the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. Let us pray together. O oh God of grace, we give you thanks for nourishing us at this, our Lord's table, where all are welcome, for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of blessing. So have you filled, as you have filled us, so now send us out, that we might be a source of hope and peace to those who hunger for the good news that we know in Christ Jesus, in whose name we rejoice to pray. Amen. And we are called to be one at this table and in the world, those who are like us and those who are so very different from us. So let us go with the peace of Christ filled in us that we may share it with those around us. As we go this day, may the peace of Christ indeed, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. 